hosting journalist Brian Karam this evening, here to talk about his new book, Free the Press, The Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. To post a question at uh, any point during the discussion, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Free the Press. O'Brien's journalism career has ranged across print, broadcast, and online media, and stretches back nearly 40 years. He currently serves as the senior White House correspondent for Playboy. He also hosts the podcast, Just Ask the Question, which features conversations about politics, current events, and pop culture. During the Trump presidency, Brian himself became the story on an occasion or two in confrontational exchanges with administration officials, among them Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders and White House aide Sebastian Gorka. White House even tried to suspend Brian's press pass in 2019 before a judge blocked the move and an appeals court panel later chided the White House for having violated Brian's constitutional due process rights. In Free the Press, Brian combines a history of the dramatic change in US news media in recent decades with tales of his own experience in the business. He describes the disappearance of many news organizations, the spread of bias in news reporting, and the tensions between the government and the fourth estate. He also offers at the end some ideas for uh, reviving a vibrant and, and free press in this country. Publishers Weekly called Free the Press a trenchant study of what ails the American press, enlivened by Brian's vivid memories of the good old days. <laughs> Uh, I want to hear all about those good old days in a minute, Brian. Um, now, in conversation with Brian this evening will be Zachary Karam, who uh, you may notice has the same last name. And that's because he's Brian's son. Uh, and he's a writer, director, and executive producer of the same podcast that Brian hosts, Just Ask the Question. Uh, Zachary also is a writer of political satire and has been working on a science fiction short film currently in post-production. So, uh, Brian and Zachary, the screen is yours. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. And, and Zach, thank you for doing this. Um, I, I'm open for, I mean, I'll start out, I guess, Brad, I'll talk a little bit about the good old days <laughs> because I'm old. But um, the story everyone always wants to know is, you know, who was the first president you met? And, and for me, it was Ronald Reagan. And um, as the story goes, <clears throat> I was upstairs in the upper press. Um, I was mere 20, callow youth of 25. And I was standing upstairs. And usually back in those days, you would bang on the door. And then, you know, uh, well, at least Helen Thomas did. And, and uh, Sam Donaldson, who was kind enough to write the intro for this book, and um, bang on the door and say, hey, Larry, they were just saying, Larry speaks, get out of here and talk to us. And one day I was up there just seeing how things were going and uh, Secret Service came through and said that the president was going to come through and, and we all had to leave. So we all turned to leave, whoever was there, I don't remember who was there that day. And I, I turned to leave and tripped and fell on the floor because I was, you know, uh, I, I've always been graceful. And as I was there on the ground, I looked up and who was standing over me, but the president of the United States and Ronald Reagan looked down at me and said, well, young fella, you don't have to bow to me. And so uh, uh, that was my introduction to DC uh, presidential politics. Um, the book is about, talks about how, unfortunately for the last 40 years, uh, the federal government, state and local governments have all destroyed the free press. And um, in doing so, it's through, um, through dismantling the, uh, a lot of the guardrails that were in place to make sure that we were fair and, and free. And if you talk to whether it's someone on the left or someone on the right or someone in the middle, everybody says that there's something wrong with the press. They just don't know what it is. They, they think they know what it is, but they don't. And this is a book that takes a good hard look at what is actually wrong with the press in the United States. So that, yeah, you do that. yeah, absolutely. So to that point, actually, um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you what, you know, you've identified the problem. Um, and then I kind of, you know, take a step forward here and I want to find out how long and how far away are we from 
uh, fixing things like and it, is there specific le legislation that needs to be passed at a like a local a state a federal level um yeah i'll start there yeah i th i think on a federal level we need to go back to the fairness doctrine and, and reintroduce the fairness doctrine um and make it uh, applicable across uh the internet and across uh broadcasting and radio there are those who say you can't it can't be done but they also said um they couldn't do it with you know television and we managed to do it uh, and local, and then, i'm sorry at the state and local level we need to make sure that uh public notice ads are protected uh those are the, we have been local newspapers have almost ceased to exist community newspapers hardly exist anywhere there's vast news deserts in the united states and we need to cure that by supporting uh local and uh and community newspapers and those uh, public notice ads are a big part of the budget for many small newspapers. They also let people know what's going on uh, in their community, and we need those. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just wanted to clarify, um, you know, for people listening, if, if they're not aware of the fairness doctrine and what it actually entails, I just wanted to. Fair. <laughs> I know, but you know, yeah, yeah, I, you know, it's inherent in the name. But I, I want to know, yeah, if you could. Just, uh, well, you know, the fairness doctrine, it, as written in 1949 and uh, introduced during the uh, Truman uh, administration, made it um, possible for and, and made it uh, um, actually necessary that if you were broaching a subject of controversy, that you had to provide fair and you know both sides of the story. You had to make sure that there was a fair, if you said. Uh, that you know, war was inevitable, then, then you also had to say, well, all right, someone on the other side would say, hey, you know, it's not. Right. right. And, and the problem when you took away the fairness doctrine is that what happened with the, when, when Reagan administration got rid of the fairness doctrine, it created vast news silos where you would only turn to where you wanted to go for the news that you wanted. Right, your, so your information bubble. Yeah, and so news cap stopped being information, but became entertainment. And we ceased telling people what they need to know and started telling them what they wanted to hear. And that's why I say that uh, good journalism and capitalism are incompatible, though they're also tethered together. And that's the, that's the damnedest of it. Okay, so to, to that point then, before uh, the Fairness Doctrine was repealed or uh yeah what uh what just i want to get like a little bit more like with, with the tv uh with the you know the tv stations the radio stations and the newspapers did it it made them uh well it was what, for, it was for tv and radio okay and, and not for newspapers right yeah, newspapers had other problems newspapers have long had um far greater problems and newspapers have had a problem of of television and radio and the internet um, taking away their audience. Um, once radio, actually, once radio opened up, that shortened the news cycle. Uh, newspapers used to be great, great places to go for information and, uh, and in-depth information. One of the, I, you know, as you know, I collect uh, newspapers, old newspapers, one of the, the greatest uh, copies of an, well, original copy of a newspaper that I have is is from 1865 and it's Abraham Lincoln's, it's in the New York Observer and it's it, the news account of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. It's yeah. better than a lot of, of, uh, uh, of, you know, history books that I've read. And the, the thing about newspapers that were, are, yeah. were, are and still great is that you can't hack a newspaper. It's the same today as it was in 1865 when it was printed. What we're doing here now is ephemeral. It, it can be hacked. It can be changed. It can be erased. You can have deep fakes. But one of the things that made the newspaper so great, and by the way, one of the things that let Christianity spread was that the Bible was printed. It was the greatest thing that was ever printed for hundreds of years since Gutenberg invented it. First thing they invented was a Bible. It was a top 10 seller. Everyone read the same source material. And that's what newspapers were, the same source material over a great deal of distance. And it was a great, it, it, you know, it helped the United States become a little bit more civilized. And at the beginning of uh, when our national uh, um, Congress got together for one of its first things, but well, first meetings, one of the first things that they did in Congress was to subsidize newspapers and allow them to transport newspapers cheaply through the U.S. mail. 
Right. And so that helped educate and, and uh, you know, that, that helped us become an informed, educated electorate. So what the Fairness Doctrine did was try to codify in on television some of the very principles and precepts that had gone into newspaper that were thought of in newspaper for a long time. And it worked. And there was never any really serious repercussions for those who didn't do it because most people did do it. And because that they did do it, everybody kind of hopped on the bandwagon and said, okay, we got to be fair. We got to do this. We got to do that. And we don't do that anymore. We don't give both sides, you know, both sides is, is, is a fine edge to walk. I, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm not going to report that, you know, that I, I, when I report about men going in space, I'm not going to have somebody sitting by my side, you know, telling me the flat earth society version of it. I'm not going to have of people course, right. that, that, you know, that the Holocaust didn't happen. And, and I'm not going to listen to people telling me that, you know, January 6th was a walk in the park. I was there, that was an insurrection and that was dangerous and it should never be repeated. I won't repeat the lies, but they're for reasonable people and reasonable facts, when facts are vetted, reasonable opinions can differ and we need to air those. Absolutely. Oh, so if you don't mind, I do want to take a quick step back then. Um, tell you, baby, whatever you I want. totally change the subject here, but you know, just talk about you a little bit more just because um, I want to know why, you know, I personally, maybe know this, but I wonder why you feel you're uniquely suited to understanding the problems that are facing the American media. And, you know, so I, I you don't need to get, obviously go over your bio, but I want to know why. Because huh? my oldest son told me I was. Oh, uh, that's true. Well, I mean, that is a very, yeah, that's a strong <laughs> argument. I, you, know, you, you know this, and I, and I don't mind sharing it with people. I, you know, I've been a reporter since well, I started in high school as a reporter working for the Jefferson Reporter in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, part-time. And I went to college at the University of Missouri and, uh, or as, you know, as my father-in-law said, Missouri. And um, I, I worked at the Kingdom Daily Sun Gazette. And, um, uh, you know, and my first job after leaving college and uh, getting married and having a, you know, the oldest son that's sitting here with me. You know, <laughs> we, you know, we were, went down to Texas and I, I've traveled uh, quite a bit and done quite a bit. And I think one of the unique things that what, what you don't get to see uh, from reporters is there have been, because of the constriction in our news business, there are fewer reporters today. There's twice the number of people on the planet as on the day that I was born, half the number of reporters. And when we lived in Laredo, Texas, um, you know, there was 100,000 people. There were two daily newspapers in English, I think one or two in Spanish. Uh, There were uh, three or four uh, television stations that did news, uh, several radio stations. And I went back there last uh, year and the year before when uh, uh, for for the border crisis. And there's 300,000 people. So there's three times the number of people as when I was living there. And there's one newspaper and one television station. Hello to Heatwave Burler. I know you're still there doing the, doing the, the weather. But that's, that's what's happened to journalism. So there's few of us left who know what it was like back in the you know, good old days. And I felt like it was my responsibility to pass on to others what journalism really was what I grew up believing it to be and what we can, you know, make it once again. So that's the, that's the short story. But yeah, but to that point, so to that point, then can you kind of elaborate on why, you know, uh, it's obvious that like a lack of, you know, diversity of ownership and, you know, lack of institutional knowledge is bad for the news media, but like why, why, why does it specifically matter that someone has 30 or 40 years experience? Not, not necessarily that many, but why does it, you don't need to have that much, but like, why does it matter more than hiring someone directly out of college? You know what I mean? Like what is your hiring for? people out of college? Look, you need to know people. Um, you need to spend your time. Um, I, I'm still, you know, I hope I'm still learning after all the time I've spent doing this, but I think you need to know your way around um, a city council meeting, a PTA meeting. I think you need to cover high school sports. I think you need to cover, uh, you need to make yourself well aware of what's going on in the city manager's office or the county clerk's office. 
know how to get information and know how to talk to people. Uh, a lot of people it shocked me most, uh, and it's happened several times when I've walked into the White House and I've had people come up to me and go, I, I really don't know what I'm doing here. I was kind of dropped into this and, and it's their first job out of college. Yeah. And you really need to have more experience. It, you're going to be taken advantage of the elitism that they talk about in journalism exists. And it's because we hire people who are straight out of college. Maybe they got their master's degree, but they never once had to cover a high school sporting event, never once had to go and uh, cover a PTA meeting, never once had to do any of those things that so I've don't have those contacts. Is that kind well, of what you're saying? You don't have the experience and of experience. Yeah, of course, how to talk right. to people and, and how to get information from a variety of people and right. finding out what binds us together. One of the great things about a community newspaper is look, it, it, when all that's left is national news, it's divisive by its very nature. Democrats, Republicans, Communists, social people don't even know what socialism is or capitalism is. They they hear these buzzwords and and these slogans and they're you know this that was one of the things that we were warned about back in the back in the fifties during the McCarthy era and that and that's also in the book when we're uh, this is a nineteen fifty eight RTNDA uh, conference and you know the uh, speaker there is talking about how if we don't catch this in now that we're gonna be overtaken by sloganism and by propaganda, and we have been. It's the fact that, you know, you and I may disagree about an issue at, at the national level, fine, but every one of us wants our streets paved, wants to make sure that the street lights work. Why is why can't I get milk at the local grocery store? All of those are local, and why can't I get clean water? Most of the major national stories all, had, all were given birth in a community newsroom. And that's why you've got to have that community journalism. Montgomery County, where I live, there's more than a million people. When I first moved here, there was a daily newspaper, the Montgomery Journal. There were two weekly newspapers, or three, and, and the Washington Post covered it, as well as radio and television. Today, there's none of that. There's And the Washington Post has scaled back its coverage. Jeff Bezos, when, when he bought the, the Washington Post scaled back the coverage and killed the weekly uh, newspaper that they ran. So th that's that's the problem. If you don't have reporters on the ground, it's that ability to gather news. It's that ability to be tied into your community. We're not a part of the community. It's like we're called the enemy of the people, but we're not. We are the people. There just aren't enough of us doing the job. And so also, when you have boardrooms that are controlling things, and boardrooms are, are usually on these large vulture uh, capital, venture capitalists, I call them vulture capitalists, but th these venture capitalists that own two or 300 newspapers, that was never supposed to happen. There was, there was legislation introduced in the 80s to, to limit the ownership, and it was killed. And Reagan said, no, the stronger newspapers will survive, and that's better for the First Amendment. And that's not true. You need more voices. You need Ben Bagdicki, one of the most unsung heroes of mine in, in, in journalism, said there needs to be real diversity of ownership if we're going to have diversity of ideas. And we don't have that. And, and that's, uh, and that's what experience will teach you. But more than, more than anything else, I think it just teaches you what's really going on in the world. You, you know, I didn't know when I was 25 years old what the hell I was doing. And I, I told, I've told many reporters that have worked for me, they said, well, this is what I think. And, and I go, I don't care what you think. What do you know? I barely care what I think. I think, no, I, I want to know what you know. And vetted facts, teaching people how to vet facts, how to gather facts, that's the important thing. Journalism is printing stuff that isn't propaganda and isn't PR. And so you're going to anchor someone with the present of facts, it, even in high school sports. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Well, to that point, um, yeah, I mean, even in the book, like, uh, to that point, and you, you know, in the book, you quote, yeah, you, you don't say who it is, you quote a wise man, you say journalism is always about bringing up information people want buried, otherwise, it's nothing more than propaganda. Um, so, yeah, kind of to that point, where does that, how do you see the government, or how do you see it being uh, fixed in, you know, in the future, obviously, you need um, a cooperation between the government and the private corporations, and that's accomplished through legislation. Is that kind of what you're you're arguing well, for there? 
this is the thing that the uh, most controversial aspect of the book. And it's the thing that angers uh, large boardrooms the most. And that is you need to break up the media monopolies. Right. Okay. Uh, you have to create uh, smaller, more competitive companies. At the same time, that's not the cure all. Uh, reinstituting the, you know, the lanes in which we drive, you, you, you know, <clears throat> Roger Ailes helped destroy the United States. And there's no other way to say it. Uh, he, he hooked on, he latched on to Nixon and then Reagan and then Fox News and created the crap that we have to deal with today. There's no way of, you cannot deny that. But there's more that needs to be done. It's, we need a, a national shield law. So reporters, you know, I went to jail four times. I remember walking out of jail holding uh, my young son in my hand as I walked in. Oh, yeah, that was you. <laughs> you, you and, and your mom and I'm walking out of jail after two weeks and, you know, having to spend time there because I, I kept the source confidential. And there are others, you know, that have done that. And you shouldn't have to do that. You, yeah. you shouldn't use the Espionage Act to go after reporters, as presidents have done. You, you need besides the um, besides putting the rails back on and making sure that the fairness doctrine and a national shield law and busting up media monopolies, you really need to start at the ground level and you need to support through subsidies and tax breaks. You have to support community journalism. That's where it all begins. If we don't support community journalism, we're done. It's that simple. And if we don't understand that, then God help us. Our, the founding fathers understood that quite well. And that, while less controversial in, in, in speech, is actually more controversial indeed, because it takes actual government, it's government working actually against itself, because government doesn't want to be held accountable, or at least most of the people I know in government really don't want to be held accountable. And those that do aren't long for government. How many of the people who voted to Impeach Ronald, uh, impeach Ronald, impeach Donald Trump uh, in the Republican Party are not running for re-election. I mean, it's hard to survive in a divisive environment, and we need to make it less divisive. Community newspapers help bind communities together. I mean, you may think how many? How many think about it? How many times have parents cut the the pictures out of a community newspaper because their kid was in it? How many? How many times have you gone and you go? Well, gee, what's going on this weekend? Go to the newspaper and right, find and out. builds inherent trust in it. I, and how many times I, I've talked to, and there's a great part in this book when I'm talking to a guy about uh, community ads. You know, the salesman used to go and read these these uh, public notice ads and go, okay, this estate sale was here, and this person is moving here. This person got this job. And that's how they would approach him and get, hey, I'm the car salesman in your area. Or, hey, I'm doing this. And you know, let's get together and let's talk. It was a way of bringing a community together. And we've got, we've got to do that. And we don't, and that when your community is together, you're less likely to want to kill your neighbor or go after your neighbor or accuse them of being anti-American. If you've also shared, you know, your kids are on the same team or you've worked together to get a road paved or, you know, all of the things that bring a community together are part of the community newspaper experience. And I ran one of the, well, as you know, I ran uh, two of those for more than a dozen years. And <clears throat> that those newspapers are vital to what's great and good about America. And we're sacrificing them and that's got to stop. So, but, so then you feel that the future of local news, it will also be print, right? Like it, obviously everything is going online, yeah, but yeah. you want the print paper because of its, you know. I want all of it. I, you know, the biggest problem page, about, the, the biggest problem today is we don't understand that, and, and newspapers haven't learned this yet. And many television stations are behind the times and, and, you know, all right, look, <laughs> to call yourself a journalist at the very least, you need a copy editor. Someone who's going to say, uh, that's spelled wrong. That doesn't make sense. Let's go back and look, is that a fact? And verify facts. Otherwise, you're just a blogger and there's no, uh, no offense to them. Uh, you're welcome right. to your opinion. Those are opinions and they should be labeled as such. But newspapers and television stations, radio stations, and those on the internet have not learned yet that the internet is a great unifying force. It, it, and we have divided ourselves because of it. But the, unif the unification behind it that's, that could be behind the potential is great. 
and if it's used properly. Um, and, and the thing is, is today a newspaper isn't just a newspaper. It's a radio station. It's a live stream. Right. It's, you can go live now. From, yeah. you know, I, can, I can go live with this. I, I, and I have. And so can a television uh, reporter. So can a newspaper reporter. A newspaper reporter can go live from the scene of a fire with this and put it on their website. Of course, well, yeah. The, the greatest advantage, the, the greatest thing that newspapers bring to, to the front and, and is so needed is context and depth and not just the stuff that goes on, you know, right now. And I mean, how many times when I was a kid did you pick up and you look at the scores and who scored this and who scored that? And, oh, this person did that. And, oh, by the way, this happened. You don't get that anymore. You have to search for it. Uh, and that's not, you know, that, nobody wants to sit around and search for 30 minutes when if you knew that, wow, uh, the courier has it. Let me go to the courier because that's right. Everything is OK. Right. It's a one stop shop. If it, and that's the bottom line today, your newspaper has to be your one stop shop for everything. And if that if, if newspapers took that attitude and hired people instead of firing them uh, and were willing to take a smaller percentage of, of uh, profit versus a greater the, they're so short sighted. You know, newspaper hedge fund owners are like maximum profit, minimum time. It, it should be long term profit, sustainable profit over many years to make newspapers viable. Right. So uh, I'm going to come back to that actually in a few. But what I want to do uh, right now is talk a little bit about what's cool about the book is that it's also not only is it, uh, you know, kind of a uh, Describe, prescribing kind of the ailments of, of our, you know, fourth estate right now, and then also offering, um, you know, um, remedies and solutions, but it also is a how-to on uh, kind of how to do journalism. And so one of the cool things I've, you know, throughout it is um, you, all of the anecdotes that kind of, I feel like uh, build a really good narrative and how, like kind of teach how, uh, how it is to do, you know, be a journalist. And one of the things that you talk about, I uh, kind of want to ask you about was, where did it go? Uh, what is the purpose of being a burster of balloons, you know, and, and why does that make you a good reporter? And, and who said that? That was, uh, that was actually told to me by Barry Bingham Sr. Um, I was, and the story behind that is I was a big H.L. Mencken fan. And if anybody listening or watching uh, um, wonders who H.L. Mencken is, I recommend you read him because he was very cogent and very on point about the problems of journalism and politics a hundred years ago. And, and he talked about chain store problems, you know, it's the market approach to chain store journalism that's ruining independent journalism. It used to be, as he said, that uh, the rewards in this business came in and the freedom of expression, and now they come chiefly in money. And that's the simple fact of the matter is, is there's nothing easier in, on earth than to fool a reporter. And he has some wonderful anecdotes about that. But my personal anecdote about that was I was working at the Courier Journal and Loyal Times, and I thought that's where I would spend my life. Uh, because I had grown up reading that newspaper is always one of the top 10 newspapers in the country. And, uh, and it's where I was inspired and aspired to be. And uh, I wasn't there long before they sold it <laughs> to Gannett. But <clears throat> one day I was sitting and I had a, a, uh, a quote from H.L. Uh, Mencken above my desk. And one day I walked in uh, from trying to get an interview and uh, the secretary for the section, the neighborhood section I was working in said, uh, uh, Brian uh, Senior wants to see you upstairs, and I I thought I was getting fired because uh, Senior never wanted to see anybody. Is Barry Bingham Senior was the the, you know, the patriarch of the family and nobody not not the lowest guy on the totem pole. Not me. I never would see him. So I I went upstairs and I was trying to figure out what the hell I did wrong. <clears throat> and I got upstairs and the secretary said, Ah, Mr. Karen, uh, you know he'll see you now. And I'm going, Oh crap! I sat in beautiful office and. Um, it dawned on me slowly over a few minutes that, you know, as he asked about my family and knew, you know, members of my family because uh, they were judges and lawyers. And it dawned on me that maybe I wasn't going to get fired. And he said, uh, are you the one that posted that that notice above your your desk, that quote from Henry? And I go, Henry, who the hell's Henry? And I go, oh, oh, H.L. Mencken. I go, uh, yeah, that's how did you know that? And he goes, nothing happens in my newspaper I don't know about. And then he, he sat by and 
and talked to me for, you know, it was less than an hour, but for me, a young reporter, it seemed like days as he talked about his friendship with H.L. Mencken. Wow. And he talked about knowing Mencken. And then he said something that I'll never forget. He said, Mencken was a wonderful burster of balloons at a time when balloons needed to be burst. And, and I, I said, uh, well, who does that now? And he looked at me and he goes, yeah, I wonder. And that was how I left it. And so I, I always took it as inspiration to, to burst balloons. And by that, what he meant was to uh, poke holes in the BS. And politicians are full of it. Uh, others are full of it. And it's your job as a reporter to go after the facts. One of my early mentors was, uh, was, was and is, and one of my dear friends today is Sam Donaldson, who I love dearly. And Sam was, you know, he said, look, he doesn't blame the president or their people for trying to put their best foot forward. That's their job. Right. But our job is to challenge them on the facts challenge their policy, challenge their utterances so the American public gets to know the truth, and then the public decides what to do with the facts. And so that's always, always stuck with me. And I, it, it is, when you point out that someone's full of it, it doesn't mean that you're, at, that you're automatically friends of the guy that opposes them. Uh, I have as, you know, as much problem with politicians on either side. Or against them, you know. Yeah, it's just that today there's one side that adheres to science and one who wants to, you know, drink Clorox. And I, I'm not going to do that. So I, you know, it's, it's, it's those things that, that are, you know, in the neighborhood of burst, I will burst that easily and eagerly burst the balloon that only I can fix the problem that ingesting Clorox is good for you, that, that dog dewormer or horse dewormer will help you. I, you know, stay in your lane, the scientists are this, and then we'll point out the facts. And that's, you know, I, I think you should clearly label your stuff as either facts, you know, this is news, facts, or opinion. And I don't think, and one of the things I, I have a problem with are uh, young reporters going, oh, I, I want to be a, a columnist. How many years experience do you have? Two. Yeah. When you got 10 or 12, come back to me and then, and then maybe I'll value your opinion. But you don't know enough to have one. And that's where, where you need good, solid management. But when you're paying people... It used to be that you had to have five years experience to go anywhere, right? And now they're hiring you straight out of, of school. And then when after five years, when you need a raise and you're making more money and you got a family, they boot you out and hire another person who's cheap. Right. And so that's, that's, you know, the first thing that was said to me when I walked into the briefing room in 1986 from Sam was, he said, Brian, that first row in the Brady briefing room, seven seats, there's about 200 years of experience there. Listen to every one of them and learn from them. Today, there's less than half that amount of experience in there. And that's, we have lost institutional knowledge. So it's harder to burst those balloons. So to that question, then I, it kind of leads me, how do you... Uh, I mean, you know, and it's, it's something that we've kind of touched on, obviously, a little bit earlier on in the conversation, but um, we haven't like, kind of, like outright said it, but like, how do you then, or you talk about it in the book. So I want to hear you kind of explain how you, um, your idea for solving the new, like news deserts and, you know, because they're so, it's such a large problem that everything's just being amalgamated and, you know, we're only getting. Well, if you break up the monopolies, that's the start. And then, like I said, you get to have, uh, you're going to have to subsidize uh, community journalism. There's just no other way to do it. You've got to give them tax breaks. <clears throat> you've got to give them, uh, you've got to get them low interest loans. And that's why I, one of the things I also propose in this book is that I think the president of the United States ought to impanel a, a blue ribbon commission and get uh, leaders in this industry to talk about how to revive and save the industry. I think we need to put all of our heads together if we can put together an infrastructure and pass an infrastructure bill, look, this affects everybody, right or left. Everybody needs facts and news. So it, I, I know that there are enough people on both sides of the aisle that want this done. For heaven's sakes, I think it was Jim Jordan and, um, and Jamie Raskin who co-sponsored the last uh, bill for a national shield law. Yeah, Two right. more different people you'll never find but they agree on the need for free speech and supporting it. And those, we need to get these people together and get legislation passed and, and get, you know, bailouts and if we can bail out the large 
SNLs, we can bail out, you know, small newspapers. And I think that should be our priority. And I know now we're, we're, we're getting close to the time where we got to field some other questions, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, the, well, that's what I'm going to do here. Actually, I was going to transition over and, and uh, ask Go you some of these it. audience questions. What? Go for it, whatever you got. All right. Yeah. So um, this comes from an anonymous attendee. Uh oh. Ask. Uh, da, 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 wait, hold on. Where would it go? What would be your first step in changing the relationship between the people and the press? How can we get the people to trust the press again? Well, you got to get a uh, you got to get an independent press. It's that simple. And look, your reputation is built every day on on making sure that what you're reporting is factual and people are going to make mistakes. I you're not fake media. You're just a human being. You know, when the uh, Titanic was first reported, I've got four different newspaper front pages downstairs in my house <clears throat> that say, you know, everyone saved, 200 people died, 300 people died. I went to the fourth one, which was a week later that came out with the right numbers. It wasn't fake media, it wasn't false news. It was what well, the best news we had at the time that we printed it. We need to A, understand that. And B, when we do make mistakes, here's something that we don't have much of today, and that is ombudsman. We need to make sure that when we make a mistake, we acknowledge that we made the mistake and we correct the mistake as quickly as possible. If you can't do that, you're in deep trouble. All right. Next question. I'm ready. A good question and a good answer. Mr. Guest. All right. So actually, I'm going to start at the top here because it's a little different. But what this comes from uh, audience member Patricia. And she asks, what do you consider the best question you've ever asked? Uh, are you free Saturday night um, when I asked your mother out for a date? Uh, <laughs> but, well, I'll approve of that answer because it led directly to me. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Professionally, I think the best question I, I, I don't know. That's a good, that's, a, that's actually a, a great question. I think the question I asked that had the most impact uh, was the one I asked September 23rd of uh, Donald Trump and uh, before the election and said, win, lose, or draw, will you accept a peaceful transfer of power? And I think that showed us right then that the insurrection was, was imminent. And uh, I, I think that's the most impactful question I've, I asked of him. Yeah, abs yeah, absolutely. Um, so moving on, I'm going to keep on going here. What's your current, this comes from an anonymous attendee. So this is a uh, What's your current impression of how the press interacts with the government? Are reporters more buttoned up? And does uh, that keep them from posing important and difficult questions to the leaders? Uh, my impression is the press interacts um, with the government pretty poorly. We need to challenge them. And I think that comes because um, I don't think reporters are more buttoned up. I think they're afraid of losing access more than anything else. And I think that uh, they're younger and less experienced and, the one thing I always tell young reporters when, when I have them working for me is you don't work for the government. Those people work for you. Hold them accountable. Put their feet to the fire. Uh, truth to power. I'll back you a thousand percent. You never have to worry. Go after them. If you're uh, afraid that you're going to get fired or lose access because you're doing your job, uh, that's a problem. Okay, absolutely. Um all right, let's keep on going here. Anonymous attendee, again, how have you adapted to the digitization of news media? How does it help or hurt journalists? I think I covered that pretty much. I, we, yeah. we have to adapt and understand that uh, newspapers, print, uh, and uh, television and radio and internet are all now pretty much the same. I mean, there's components of newspapers, you know, on all your television uh, websites. You just need better copy editors. More, that's more copy editors. If we need anything else in the world, we need copy editors. Okay. Oh, I see the next one is from Brennan. Okay. <laughs> uh, you want me to do that one? All right. So yeah, to follow up on the question earlier, after everything you've been through, especially the last few years, do you have an optimistic view of the future? And if so, what does that look like? I do have an optimistic view of the future. As long as I'm breathing, I have an optimistic view of the future. And I, I think that um, what it looks like is uh, breaking up uh, media monopolies, su supporting uh, community journalism, and uh, making sure that the rails are put back in place so that we run in the right direction. And, absolutely, and, and is that 
that leads me to a quick question. Um, do you see that at, like in the ethos in like in the White House press room, like as far as do they do the reporters there see themselves as part of the guardrails for the government or is that not? I hope uh, so. Um, I, I think we we've got to get better at framing <clears throat> the argument. And that's one of the reasons why you need experienced people in the White House who know what the issues are, who have covered the issues. I mean, one of the things, you know, Walter Cronkite was great because he had experience as a beat reporter and covered World War II. So when he went to Vietnam and reported that he didn't think that we could win, and LBJ said, I've lost middle America, if I've lost uh, uh, Walter Cronkite, people respected him because he had, he, he, he was, he never made himself the story, although he came out and gave an opinion. And, and opinions aren't unheard of in, in news. There's nothing wrong with them. You need to respect the person who's doing it. And Walter Cronkite had the respect because people knew he had the gravitas. That's the difference. We need the gravitas. We need to, our institution, respect, respect uh, that a little bit more. All right. So good. I'm moving on here. Um, this is more of a. McAfee. But what? Uh, and Pamela McAfee, I think. Right. Right. Is that the question? I think we're getting different ones. Which one are you seeing? Uh, how can you bring the fairness doctrine back? There you go. There. Yeah. How can you bring the fairness doctrine back? Without the threat without, of out. Is that what you're talking about? How can you bring the fairness doctrine back without the threat of losing your FCC license? You have to lose. You, you need to threaten them to lose their FCC license. Quick answer there. There has to be, there has to be uh, consequences for, for that. Do you, okay. Um, all right. So. Uh, here's one from an anonymous attendee. In what ways does the government uh, limit press access? Oh, well, that's quite easy. There's a number of ways in which they pr- limit access. First of all, they limit access to information by not filling out a FOIA. You fill out a Freedom of Information request, and they don't give you the information. Uh, that happens at the federal level, the state, and the local level. Uh, it- they, they make you, they charge you. They make it cost prohibitive. Oh, you want copies of that report? Well, okay, it's going to be a dollar a page. It doesn't cost a dollar a page. Yeah, it does because we got to have somebody do the job of making the copy. So, you know, you want 10 copies, you know, and, and small newspapers can't afford that. Mm. Information needs to be made available. And by the way, today, you, know, you just put it on an email and send it, you know, here's put it on this, uh, on my portable stick, you know, my thumb drive. <clears throat> that that needs to 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 take uh, a place. And then the other ways they restrict access is, oh, there's that guy that did the bad story on us. He's not going on Air Force One. Oh, there's the guy who, I'm not going to answer that question because that guy's going to be, you know, tough. I'm going to call on, uh, you know, Billy Bob over here who's going to ask me the, the easy question that I know and I like. Now, look, in the press briefing room, there are times when everyone, every press uh, agent, every press secretary has gone to the easy question that they know is going to be asked so they can get a breath in between the tough questions that they know they're going to be asked. Got no problem with that. But you can't restrict access to the reporters that are going to ask you the hard questions. Open it up. Don't close it down. That benefits the Republican. By the way, politicians, that makes you a lot better. And all the politicians who say, well, they're just going to make fun of me. We're going to make fun of you anyway. You might, as well ask, you might as well let the, the tough questions come at you. All right. Um, so we'll go on to this one here. Do you have a personal line that you won't cross when it comes to decorum or etiquette when conducting interviews? Well, yeah, of yeah. course. <laughs> um, I, I, first of all, I'm never going to lie to you and tell you I'm not a reporter. I'm going to uh, be honest with you and say this is a reporter and I got to ask you a, a question. I've seen people, you know, uh, wonder about that. Now, I have walked up to someone and asked them a question, and they didn't know I was a reporter. And I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want you to know I'm a reporter. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I, yeah, there's always ethical lines that you, you don't cross. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, dress up as a fireman. You know, there's that great uh, – uh, yeah, but on the other hand, guess what? The government has dressed up as reporters. And during the Reagan administration, they had people oh. dressed up and pretend to be reporters and crossed a very ethical line that they should never have crossed. The government does it. We should not. But I have no problem asking anyone any question at any point in time. 
There's no such thing as a bad question. There are only bad answers. Agreed. All right. Um, here we go. Anonymous attendee. As a 20 something, I appreciate your explanation of needing experience in journalism to do an adequate job. What's your best piece of advice to those first starting out? The advice I always give every reporter I've ever hired, I want you to have a balanced education. Um, I don't care if you have, you know, a degree. Honestly, I don't. You know, <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's not what's important. What I want you to be balanced, fair, and curious. I want you to, to go out and be happy with what you're doing and always ask another question. And always, if you walk out <clears throat> of the newsroom thinking the story is A, be prepared for it to change directions and it would be B. Without that, you can't, um, well, that's me. Without that, you cannot uh, be a good reporter. You have to be um, willing and able to, uh, to change your mind on, at, at a moment's notice. Be curious. Um, here we go, Brian. Can I skip one? And we'll go back to Janice, but <clears throat> I just saw Jeff Spivak is up there. Yeah, that's one I was going to move on to. Okay, yeah. ask, ask the Jeff one because he's a <laughs> Jeff. And Jeff. Uh, Spivak, <laughs> Brian, what does it say about our country that you've spent time in jail, but Donald Trump hasn't? I'm sorry, repeat because we, we kind of crossed over. Brian, what does it say about our country that you've spent time in jail, but Donald Trump has not? I love you, Jeff. <laughs> and you know I love you. That, that um, the, the, the um, I, I don't know what it says. I it it it's scary to me that that has happened. But um, I I think it tells us that um, money buys you free time. Um, I, I think it's scary that that I, I. But you know he hasn't been charged with a crime and. For the record, I was in charge with a crime. I was just, I, I was, uh, um, I had a confidential source and I was held in contempt of court. But, um, you know, uh, a little jail time would, would uh, probably make him a little more humble. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll just go here. Well, this is more of a statement. I'm to be what? I'm trying to be political about it. No, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Janice Paulson says, as an older person who is in contact with other seniors who say, I don't listen to the news, it's too depressing and sad, makes me upset. Ignorance is what uh, they want to take advantage of the people, knowledge is power, and we can't let them take it back from us. More of a statement, but yeah, your thoughts? Yeah, knowledge is power, um, yeah. and uh, you have to be curious and want the knowledge. One of the biggest problems is a lack of education in this country, lack of decent uh, reporting, and guess what? We don't vote. Uh, I mean, you know, we consider a great voter turnout slightly over 50 percent, which means even if a majority of the voters vote you in, that's still a minority of the electorate. Uh, you need to take a democracy seriously. And, you know, it was. Uh, well, you know, Thomas Jefferson, who said if he had, you know, he fought tooth and nail and I cover that in the book, too. He fought tooth and nail with the free press. And, uh, and actually <laughs> sued a bunch of times and tried to get people uh, to stop printing things. But he said, you know, given the choice between a, a no government or no press, he'd gladly take no government or, you know, words to that effect. I, I think you have to be involved. A democracy doesn't work unless people are involved and educated. So it kind of leads to actually, this is a uh, kind of follow, not necessarily follow, but, you know, <laughs> We'll just hear question from Arlene Easley. And she says, do you have ideas about how the U.S. can add guardrails to social media considering our First Amendment? This is uh, where many get their uh, their news, yet algorithms, bots, et cetera, are so destructive uh, to society. So we have. Uh... Um, well, I, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, I think that that's covered in the book. <laughs> I think pick up the book and read it. Yes. They're, they're it is covered uh, in the book. It, no, it, def it definitely is. Yeah, we can add guardrails to social media. It's it, and it's too really in depth to go into here. But I go through in the book numbers of ways in which it can be done. But the fairness doctrine can appeal, can apply, and and uh, to them, yes. Well, and kind of like to your point earlier about uh, in, in what you do address in the book is not um, excluding these uh, social media like influencers and people that are you know doing this news rather bringing them into the fold and getting them to be more uh, uh, not necessarily you know but kind of so that way you can um, introduce a lot of the um, 
you know, like the actual education professionalism well, that you were talking yeah, about. That's what I try to do in this book. I'm not uh, disparaging bloggers. I just want to educate them. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. But, uh, and they'll get mad and go, oh, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I, I can't help you there. You know, I, I know my 40 years of experience pales in comparison to the three or four you've spent doing your blog or your podcast. But, you know, if you if there was more accountability and more people doing just some of the basics of journalism, I think we'd be better off. And if that sounds elitist, I forgive me. It's just 40 years of experience talking and and uh, and, and I'm an old fart and I, I, I'm set in my ways about what journalism is. And I'm not I'm not changing that. <laughs> But I'll, can we go to Steve Rosenbaum? Yeah, let's go on and say yeah. You should. All right. So from Stephen Rosenbaum, do you think that the January 6th commission will get the Justice Department to bring charges against any members of the former administration or Congress? If so, when? Boy, hey, <laughs> I love that question, too. Uh, I think that there will be charges. We already seen the Oath Keepers have, you know, the, the head of the Oath Keepers got caught, charged in the last couple of days. Congress is another matter. I hope so. Um, and I don't know. But I think that if we're going to have justice, that the, uh, the January 6th commission is going to have to go after uh, the seditious actions of members of Congress. I think they're traitors. I was there. Make no mistake about it. We came that close to losing our democracy. The fight is still on. They need to be held accountable. Those members of Congress who are responsible need to be expelled. And if you don't agree, I'm sorry, but I was there. And I'll talk to someone else who was there and witnessed it for themselves. But I, I will not hear an opinion from someone who doesn't know what went on. And you can accuse me of anything you want, but your ignorance does not equal the knowledge that others have from firsthand experience. And if you think that makes you partisan, I would correct you and say, no, having the facts and knowing and seeing things firsthand it is tantamount to making an informed decision, which is why you need journalists. I think we need to expel those congressmen. I think we need to hold them all accountable. I would investigate, indict and prosecute every single person that was involved. All right. Well, we have like a few, so I'm going to try and... Got a couple of minutes left, yeah. What? Got a few few minutes left. Go on. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, um, and some of these, uh, some of these have been like partially addressed. So, you know, I'm just going to read through them, and if they're, you know, kind of if it opens up something, then that'd be great. So, uh, how do you get? This comes from an anonymous attendee. How do you get people to actually believe facts and not continue to spew lies as if they are facts? Well, you got to hold journalists accountable for reporting facts, okay. and then, and then once. Once the facts are reported, you have to hold people responsible for those facts. No, the fact the facts are this. And, you know, I, I, I'm staying in my lane. I'm not an infectious disease expert. I trust those people who are infectious disease experts because they, they went through a lot of education to get where they are. Dr. Fauci isn't the problem. Dr. Fauci is part of the solution. And if you can't accept that as a fact, I can't, I can't help you. There's just no way of helping you. Okay. All right. So moving on, did you spend a lot of, an, another anonymous attendee, did you spend a lot of time reading through legislation? Would it be worth oh, yeah. it to simplify some of our legal rhetoric? Most Americans, not lawyers. Well, yeah. And most lawyers aren't writers though. They think they are. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the, uh... <laughs> there's two. I, I do want to get to, uh, well, did you want to answer that one? I mean, yeah, I think that's the answer. I, would it be worth? Uh, yes, I would love to simplify our legal rhetoric because most Americans, uh, most lawyers aren't writers and they think they are. They love the sound of their own voice. No, absolutely. So we should. OK. OK. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to go to that one interview pet peeves. Can I answer that one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can you share any interview? Pet yeah, my I have one big pet peeve when I interview someone. Don't piss in my ear and tell me it's raining. I, I grew up from a long line of uh, my, my dad sold cars for a living. My uncles were attorneys. My grandfather was a, a lawyer and a judge. I know bullshit when I smell it. So you can try to bullshit me. You can try to bamboozle me all you want. But brother, just tell me the truth and things go a lot easier. So my pet peeve is when people try to BS me and think I'm going to fall for their BS. And don't try to intimidate me either. That, that doesn't work. Uh, the last president found that out. Just 
be just deal with me honestly. And that's yeah. the best way to do it. All righty. So um, let's see here. Where do you draw a line when it comes to canceling people and limiting access to media? Some people think Trump is better off as a candidate now that he's banned from Twitter. I don't believe in canceling anybody. I don't believe in reporting on Trump because uh, I don't care what he says right now. When he makes news, I, I wrote a column about this a few weeks ago. After he is indicted or if he is indicted or if he declares himself a candidate, then he becomes newsworthy again. His, his ramblings and his uh, misogynistic speaking and his self-glorification is just an idiot on the sidelines screaming. And we got enough of them and I don't care. So um, I, I, I don't cancel. I don't think anybody should be canceled. That's garbage. But I sure as hell don't need to uh, report on Donald Trump right now because he's also garbage. Okay, interesting. <laughs> so, um, kind of a, I like that uh, one on the bottom too. Can like you, that one, all right. Yeah. So from anonymous to me, is there anything that you would have done differently over the course of your career? I would have brushed my teeth better. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't because I like where I am now. So if I'd done anything differently, I wouldn't be where I am now. Um, I don't regret any action that I've taken as a reporter. My mistakes, I learned from them. We all make them. Um, and if you're happy where you are as a human being, then there really is no need to visit. Uh, what would I have done differently over the course of my career? Uh, I did what I thought I needed to do at the time I did it. Um, sometimes I was right. Sometimes I, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm a human being. Uh, we're all going to be right and all going to be wrong. Um, all right. So this one just came in from uh, Mary Marlene and it's, uh, she says, I see nonsense report on so many of my TV stations here in Utah. How does a consumer of news? And then she didn't finish the question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> how, do right. you, how do you discern what I, I think where she's going with that is yeah. uh, how do you discern? That's where you need to be a, a voracious consumer of news and facts. Uh, more than one source. Um, and how do you complain to the networks? That's easy. Call them up uh, if it's a network. Uh, if it's a local television station, call the local television station. Uh, it, you know, people say you can't fight City Hall. Sure you can. You just got to do it. It's not easy. Um, I think we got one, two, one more maybe. If, yeah, one more. Oh, we got two more. Let's try yeah. and get them both in. Yeah. Would you ever consider opening up your community paper again? I would love to at some point in time consider doing it. I think it's real important to have community newspapers. Uh, they're fun to, they're, they're actually fun to work on. Um, young reporters are my favorite reporters to work with because they all want to learn. And they're all, you know, if you, I've been very blessed with the people that have worked for me, they've all been really, really good. And I've enjoyed the experience immensely. And finally, can you talk about the importance a firsthand experience, i.e. working and reporting on the border or covering city hall, et cetera? Well, I think there's nothing uh, more important um, than being out in the field and work. Uh, the, the, I learned a lot working on the border, enough to know that the BS that uh, passes today is that BS. Uh, you need to get out and see for yourself these things. That's one of the best. I'll end it this way. The best part of being a reporter is getting to go out and see the world as it really is and reporting it to your fellow citizens and letting them know what's going on. And there's a joy in seeing it with your own eyes. Traveling the world on somebody else's nickel is really good too, since most reporters aren't paid squat. So it, the idea of, of uh, traveling the world and seeing what's going on is really, really important. And I've appreciated all of that. All right, well, I think that's... I think we got Brad back with us. Uh, uh, good, good job moderating, Zach. Yeah, I think you've you've done your dad proud. And um, and Brian, uh, don't don't you, don't you love it when uh, when your kids ask you why it matters if someone has thirty or forty years of experience? <laughs> well, I, uh, I yeah. get that too from from my kids every now and then. But as as your book as your book shows, Brian, it it certainly does help uh, not only to know the history of journalism. Uh, in this country, but but to have experienced it, and you do provide a lot of perspective and some very constructive suggestions for reviving what's been what's been lost, unfortunately, in the news media. Um, well, thanks, Brad. I appreciate that. Sure. 
To everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of Free the Press. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well.